Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar series. My name is Hadi Rangin. Uh, without looking at your names, I, I believe I uh, have the chance to meet most of you or many of you. Then if not, then uh, nice meeting you all. Uh, for those of you who do not know me or uh, haven't a chance to meet, uh, my name is Hadi Rangin. I'm a member of IT Accessibility Team, uh, along with Anna Marie, Gaby, Dan, Terrell. Um, and then we have been taking care of the accessibility problem of uh, campus. My primary job, my primary job, I know. The reason that I'm getting interrupted when everybody comes in or the, does send a chat, you know, I get the uh, through headset. I get, it's very interruptive. Um, my primary job is to make sure the software that we develop here or we purchase uh, are accessible, and then uh, that's why I had the chance to meet with a lot of on-campus developers as well as with the, the, uh, the third-party vendors and then testing and evaluating the, their software. So we are good at scrutinizing the application and then uh, and finding all possible bugs. <laughs> and then we communicate that to the vendors or the on-campus uh, developers to resolve those issues. Today, we will be talking about the uh, accessibility testing uh, with, with a focus on uh, accessibility testing with screen reader. So you will see that you know it is uh, not easy to do that accessibility testing with screen reader, but uh, let me share with you what we have today, what we are going to talk about. So first, I will be discussing a little bit about the difference between uh, functional and technical accessibility. Then we talk about you know uh, what and then how we test, and uh, I will introduce. Uh, the, few screen reader to you and then toward the end we will have the live demo um, and then uh, well, we, I, I, I promise to leave uh, ten, the last 10 minutes for the QA. Um, Dan and Emery feel, feel free interrupt me when we are uh, you know at the maybe 30 minutes into the session so I can plan accordingly. So what is technical accessibility? There are two methodology that we use for testing. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, we, we use them parallel. The first one is the technical accessibility. In the technical accessibility methodology, we examine uh, each element uh, to make sure the coding practice is according to the uh, to, to st existing standards. And then we use the WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guideline, for the compliance and for the standard. What does it mean? That it means uh, that uh, for us, that the element that we test, which might be a button or a menu or a graphic or uh, a anything uh, that you see uh, on the web environment, uh, they have the proper elementation. This would mean that uh, all user mouse user, keyboard user, assistive technology user can interact with that element. So it is one element at the time that we check. So, but as, as you can uh, clearly see that, it does not give us a holistic view of overall accessibility of the application. It just tell us, you know, how accessible is that specific element that you are testing. On the other hand, we have also the functional accessibility methodology that uh, in that methodology or in that uh, uh, testing, um, we um, identified, we call that functional tasks for the, or common functional tasks for a given application. And then uh, this is usually done with the help of the service manager of the product that we are using, or the people who are developing. For example, if you consider an email program, there are many common tasks that we can define for them. One of them could be just sending an email. 
And that sending process, sending an email, starts with I locating the compose button, clicking on it, going through the email header uh, forms like to CC, BCC, you know, subject uh, attachment uh, if we have, going into the body of the email, performing the necessary uh, formatting uh, or styling uh, stuff that we want. And then finally, uh, you know, spell check and then sending and receiving the confirmation that email has been successfully sent. So um, let me give a, a an memory. Can you uh, disable the waiting room so people just can jo join without going to the waiting room? Thank you. So this uh, functional accessibility evaluation, this, this method uh, looks, uh, gives us a holistic view uh, of the application because it really doesn't help us if just single elements of the application or, of the, or the interface are accessible. We need uh, that the entire process from A to Z is accessible. Um, so the conclusion is that the technical accessibility is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So in order to have a successful accessibility uh, results, we need to pass both technical and functional accessibility testing. Yeah, and I am being asked usually how, hit, how I want to do, uh, test with, uh, with screen reader, uh, how, how we can do it. Um, well, I, I usually say that please do not do it. <laughs> Let people who are using a screen reader uh, program on a regular basis and have good understanding about behavior of a screen reader program help you with that. It is a complicated application. And then, uh, so without really knowing enough about this, you know, screen reader, it, you might get a lot of false positive results and then could cause some confusion and then uh, so, and it might not, not, might not be correct. So when we do the testing, first, we need to make sure that we have good understanding first about the, the basic coding practices. As, as I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier, VCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, best practices uh, uh, for each elements that we are using on the web. Uh, and there are certain standards that we have to follow. Otherwise, you know, browser and then assistive technology program wouldn't be able to render the same information. So we have to all follow the same standard. The problem is that unfortunately some developers, they go and then they build their own custom widgets or custom elements or function uh, that, uh, that looks like a function that they want, but behind the scene, it doesn't communicate uh, properly with the assistive technology or even browser. So we are always recommending to use the uh, standard widgets that is offered uh, by uh, ARIA best practices. And then uh, uh, again, that is, uh, that is something that we need some familiarity with the coding practices be before we dive into uh, accessibility testing. And as I said, you no know, functional, uh, uh, focusing on functional accessibility is really is important. And then you should not get lost into just technical accessibility issues because as I, said, as I mentioned that um, it only ensures the accessibility of that element by itself. And then, uh, of course, in this, uh, when we are doing, uh, doing that, we are considering uh, universal design. We do not want that uh, we are just screen reader accessible, or keyboard accessible, or mouse uh, accessible. We want a balanced uh, approach 
uh, that uh, everybody, regardless what that, uh, means they use for access of, to act to interact with the information or with the website or web application, they have very similar and uh, uh, equally pleasant uh, experience. As mentioned earlier, um, function, technical accessibility is required for uh, to, to ensure the overall accessibility of the application. There are many tools uh, out there that they can help you with it. Um, at, toward the end of the presentation, we have the list of the resources and, and then we will be sharing this slide with all the participants. You do not need to take note about them because all of them are there. Um, and those accessibility testing tools, they can give us up to the most, I would say that 30% 30 30 of uh, accessibility issues, uh, but it, which is good, but there are 70 plus more uh, percentage that, that we have to check manually. Uh, frequently, when we meet with developers and then or the designer they would like to impose their design or their implementation and say that hey but you know you the screen reader we know that there are some problems here but the screen reader can go around and do this and that i mean um, these are workaround solutions the, there are um, um, many ways to interact with the application but the usual way is that you know you approach from top to bottom sometimes we see that you know we have some uh, interfaces that when you trigger that function it exposes some information or some elements before that element that you are just clicking and then if a screen reader user doesn't know what's happening, they have to go and scan the entire page about the, you know, the, the changes. Yes, we can say that this is technically accessible, but if we incorporate the time and the efficiency in this process, then we definitely are not functionally accessible. So I am very, uh, uh, opposed to finding workaround solution um, uh, and then and selling them as a kind of work, uh, as, as an accessibility solution. So please uh, note that we, we need to consider uh, efficiency and effectiveness of interaction uh, in our uh, uh, accessibility testing. Okay, before we um, okay. Before testing, uh, before we, uh, sorry, uh, then uh, can, can one of the my colleague can you go to security and disable the waiting? Thank you. First, I mean one of the first things that we do that is that just a consistency. So an app, uh, uh, no. It is not one single page always. I mean, there are a lot of pages that we have to go to through. And then uh, since accessibility is not just for a screen reader user, for everybody, and we want to make sure that uh, at least visually they are uh, consistent. I mean, it is consistent when you go from one page to the child page or subsequent page, you want to feel that you, you can identify that page and you can uh, the, see that you are in the same domain and you are doing the, uh, the task that you started from the previous page. I'm pretty sure you have experience that when you click on one page or within the process and you are uh, 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 faced with the page that it, you know it is, they are taking you to a completely different domain and different looking field and then you are asking yourself hey, am I on the same page or a different page? So and, and a good example is that when you go to a city of Seattle or King County, 
uh, you will see a lot of them, you know, for a simple, for example, simple process, for example, renewing your license, you will see that they take you through four different vendors behind the scene and every page is different. So if you do not know that, you think that you are, <laughs> you, you will be definitely lost. So after the visual consistency, we check also for the functional consistency, which means that you mean the, the, for the same functions, for example, uh, checking for I mean, just a simple thing like you know uh, when you are asking you are asked about first name last name uh, gender phone number something like that uh, we would like to see the same implementation you will be surprised how many times that Patty, uh, may yes I interrupt for a moment sure. could you please close the live transcription has been enabled message on your screen please Is not this one, right? Yes, it's on this screen that you just had up. I can't get there. That, uh... So you cannot request control, any one of you? Request control. Dan gave me uh, anomaly. I I don't see it. No, it's not. It's not turned on for the meeting. Sorry, guys, for the interruption, but let me see that how I can get rid of that because I, it doesn't gain focus. Usually it does, but. Uh, um, No, I can't. It's all right. Move, move, move okay. on. Is it, is, uh, is it very annoying? Uh, it's right across the top of the, um, uh, of your screen share. So there's not much we can do about it without restarting the whole meeting, which we won't do. That's okay. Your, your content's fully visible. It's just across the is top. It, okay. Sorry guys for, uh, inconvenience, uh, but, um, I promise that we will be sharing this uh, slide with you and we have access to the original slide. So uh, I was telling you about the functional consistency uh, as I was giving an example. You see that uh, for the same question, sometimes they use different type, uh, the, the, the different widgets. For example, in one page, they ask for, for example, gender. And then you see that they use uh, radio button, you know, male, female, or do not want to disclose or something like that. As a radio group that you can choose one. And then you see that in a, in a different page, in the same domain, part of the same process, then you see that they are using combo box. The reason that we are like, checking for this functional accessibility, uh, for, for this functional consistency is that, you know, for everybody, uh, doesn't matter if it's cited or not cited, or disabled or not disabled, uh, there is a learning curve of a uh, time phase that you familiarize with the page. And, but this learning curve is significantly longer for a screen reader user. So if I am used to seeing this domain, radio group to select the gender, I would like to see that across the entire app. So consistency and you know, functional consistency it is really important. Proper use of element is another thing. It is, uh, you will be surprised, uh, or maybe not those of you who have I had the chance to work with you. Um, you, you will see that a lot of uh, at a time developers, they confuse button with links. They use them interchangeably. Or you know you have a series of buttons, for example, back, cancel, submit, some, something like that. But you see that you know one of them is linked, two of them as buttons, or vice versa. So it is 
really a mix. They look visually, they make sure they look like you know, identical, they look identical, but unfortunately uh, behind the scene, we see a screen reader see the information behind the scene, and then if it's something is a link, we remain, if they remain linked, regardless how you, how much you try to paint it. Keyboard, keyboard operability this is another thing that we test. So we make sure that you can perform, you can, uh, you can get to all the elements, all, I'm not saying you some, all ele elements uh, uh, on the, for, for the given task. And then you can perform the task from A to Z just with the keyboard. You, you don't get to stop somewhere and say, hey, you know, Dan, come and click here for me. He has heard many times from me. And then, uh, of course, it is a requirement to, that when you are doing with the keyboard, working with the keyboard, always, and I emphasize that always the, fo the elements on fo focus must be visible must be visible. So you should never lose the focus indicator. And then uh, of course, when you are tabbing and you are a keyboard user, you are a tabby, you want that the tabbing goes in a logical um, and, um, way, in a way that it is presented to you. And if you are the keyboard user, I'm pretty sure you have experience that sometimes this is the keyboard tabbing bounces, you know, goes right top, but bottom, you know, they don't go in a proper order as they are presented to you. Um, a clarification about the shortcut keys, uh, many uh, developers, they have that, uh, um, that uh, misconception, I would call that, that they think the shortcut keys would resolve all the problems. Um, shortcut keys are not considered as accessibility solutions. They are good things to have, but they are not a, a solution that we promote. Um, they are good as long as a handful, and they are consistent, uh, and they work, and they don't have any interference with the assistive technology shortcut keys, browser, or operating system. So another thing that we check is the ARIA landmark. Uh, the simplest definition of ARIA landmark that I have uh, 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 for you is that I would say that there is a, uh, a logic, that there is a means to structure the application. Practically, you put the application in predefined uh, logical box. For example, you have a page on the, the, that has a banner on the top. You, have, you might have a navigation underneath of your banner. You might have another navigation on the left side or, and the rest of the information might be uh, considered as a main content. So as I mentioned earlier, there are seven, I mean, there are predefined uh, ARIA regions uh, that, that provide meaning. Uh, to the application. So when you come to the page uh, within a fraction of a second, you can see how the page is constructed. You can see the banner, you can see the navigation ball or bars, you can see the main content area, you can see the footer and other information. These information are not available uh, in the way that you see to a screen reader user. So by providing the ARIA landmark, you give a big picture of your application and you introduce the major component uh, uh, of your application framework. So as I said, there are seven predefined regions and then uh, they, they help us to identify here, I am in a banner, I am the main content area, or I am you know, in a footer section or whatever. So we check, I know that this is not the place for to learn about the ARIA, but we will be glad to meet with everyone to, to uh, 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 go through that. And we check for the integrity, integrity of the ARIA landmark, making sure that everything is, every content goes into uh, the ARIA content a, a region, and there is no orphan, we call that orphan content, I mean abandoned content. 
and we check for the meaning of the, or just check that if the labels are meaningful. Adi, we yes. are at we are at the three thirty mark. Thank you. So for uh, the the we usually use Aria landmark to check the integrity or uh, the structure of the application, and we use headings to check the structure uh, the, the structure of the content, uh, the, the information that goes in it. So. For those of you who are familiar with accessibility, uh, you probably heard it many times from us or from and from your different channel. We want the headings are hierarchical. You know, six level of HTML, I mean, heading level in HTML, and one to six. And we would like that every heading, I mean, every page has a unique heading one, and any sub, um, any major section has a preceding heading two, and each, if any, if your major section has a subsection divided into subsections, and you know, they need to have heading three and so on. So heading must be meaningful. So when we see the name, we can, we can identify what it means. If you tell me, for example, S25J, Three, you know, uh, you know, it, it is not a meaningful uh, label. Completeness. Some developers they think, you know, they put a couple of headings here and there. They think they are done. Yeah, it is good start, but it is not complete. With the completeness, we mean that uh, we need uh, a heading for each major section. Remember, this heading they should provide an outline of your content. So you can, if you are a developer, if you are a content creator, you can see the list of your headings. And if you think the list of the heading is logical, or hierarchical, meaningful, and gives you a good outline of the page, then you are in good shape. Other stuff. Grouping of the relevant items. That is another thing that we check for. You know, if you try to mimic a list without using the list properly, it, it is a failure. Doesn't matter how much you try, how much a good painter you are, a list are not rendered as list if you are not using uh, the list element. Graphics. So we would like that we have a meaningful graphic. Uh, meaningful label uh, or, or for informational graphic. If you are using, we are not saying that do not use graphic for a stylistic effect. Use it, but you need to make sure that you provide, you know, uh, you know the proper uh, alt uh, attribute for that, which is alt equal quote quote meaning blank or nothing. This would tell the screen reader here. This is a stylistic image, so they can they can easily they don't even render. But you need to provide a meaningful uh, label for uh, informational graphics. I will have a good example. Let's say a few good examples for fun. Forms, yeah, um, missing the form labels. It is crime. So be careful. Do that. <laughs> Make sure that your forms have proper label element, uh, uh, proper labels. And then this is an easy task. You can use these accessibility checking tools, and they can most of them they can provide you with a good uh, information about the missing labels. And then uh, one thing that we check that when we are dealing that we test when we are dealing with the accessibility testing is that we try to scrutinize the application. We purposely uh, make a failure, uh, make a you know, mistake, and we will see that how those mistakes, how the errors or warnings are communicated to us, and then uh, what is the path of recovery. And then I tell you, it is we, we have discovered many really bugs in that, system, in, in that realm. Dynamic uh, elements, you know, these are the most 
one of the most complicated elements of the web. You know, you click on something, some content changes, some element appears, and then how you communicate those information to a screen reader user who can see only one element at a time or what, uh, you know, how verbose you want to be. This is also another, um, another uh, difficult area with accessibility. Okay, now we are getting to the you know the, the screen reader testing. You know, a screen reader, uh, you know, uh, we have many screen reader in Windows environment, uh, starting with JAWS, which is a commercial one, and then it costs a lot of money. I think over almost thousand um, dollar. Um, NVDA is a free one, and then uh, with the optional donation if you want, and then uh, the, the narrator. Uh, that has made significant improvement in the past uh, couple of years. Um, in the Mac environment we have, uh, uh, or iOS, we have VoiceOver. Uh, note that accessibility of voice, I mean, uh, VoiceOver, uh, VoiceOver in iOS and Mac, they work very differently. And for the uh, Android, we have TouchBack. This is the list of the, the, the statistic of the screen reader user that, uh, you know, the statistic of uh, which screen reader you uh, use uh, in, in North America. I, th I don't think it's North America. I see it's a global. But, you know, it is not complete. And of course, it is only the, the data has been provided by a real user. How many users haven't heard about this survey? <laughs> we do not know. But they have been conducting this survey for many years. Uh, and then this is the from 2021 survey. So JAWS, which is a commercial one, is, is, is the, at the 53.7%. NVDA is about 30%. And VoiceOver is about 6.5%. And then uh, so I think I will talk about that in the next slide. But one thing I want to emphasize is a screen reader user is not made for testing. It is used, it is made for people like myself who is blind to access the information, uh, electronic information. So a lot of times screen reader, they have complicated, I would call algorithm to compensate for the lack of accessibility features. So they, uh, that's why the, this is the, why they, some of them or like JAWS is so expensive. Um, they, for example, when you go if on a four and then developer has failed to provide the label, then that screen reader program, they try, it, it tries to find the closest uh, text to it and provides that as a label. Sometimes they are right, sometimes it is not. So testing with the screen reader, if you do not know that, how a screen reader works, what mode you are, can give you a lot of wrong results. And they have a lot, hundreds, really, I'm, I'm saying hundreds of functions that, that user can customize it to their need. And then the customization that I use, very likely it is not suitable for another colleague because we might have different way of interacting and different uh, usage. And then this is new, but I wanted to share with you. We are uh, planning to offer uh, the, the workshop, a workshop, half a day workshop for each uh, screen reader program uh, training uh, in January. And the, the goal is that at this time we do that with JAWS and NVDA, but we will be glad to add also voiceover and then uh, talk back uh, if needed. I think we, I will do that also voice over for Mac, but for mobile, I think we have to see that how many, how much demand. Okay, the screen reader have two major modes, reading mode and phone mode. And each program, they have, they might have different vocabularies. For that. What does it mean? You know, the information that you see on the screen, you, you see an element with all the surrounding information, but 
uh, screen the program uh, user like me, they see only one element at a time. We see only one link at a time. We see one button at a time. We see one menu at a time, menu item at a time, list item at a time, come graphics and so on. But we have no information about the surrounding elements unless these things are, pro are provided in a programmatic way. So um, in order for us to see the page in a, in a context, then we need to be in a kind of reading mode. Uh, by default, keyboard user can only go to just focusable elements. They can go only to tabs, they can go to, to for example, a button or menu. But they cannot go to, or to a good link, but they cannot go to a static text. But a static text is part of the page. So when we are in the browse mode, we can read the information uh, uh, or, uh, from left to right, top to bottom, depending on how behind the scene, how the page is constructed. Uh, the terminology that we use, we call that linearize. We linearize the content or a screen reader linearize the content from left to right, top to bottom, again, based on the uh, coding that they have used. And that's way, that is how we read and discover the page. In this mode, when I am, for example, on a specific page and I'm reading that, so I can do that some inter limited interaction. For example, when I go and reading some text and, and it tells me here to see the, for example, that website, click here. I can click on that link and go there without leaving my mode, which is reading mode. However, if I want to have full exposure, full interaction, then I need to switch in from browse mode to form mode. In this mode, screen reader is now is passing everything to the browser. So it is not intervening. It is not intercepting any keys that you, you type. So uh, the, it is like a keyboard user. But the problem is that we do not see in that mode uh, uh, the, the static information. For example, if you have a form control, like a text box, and then it has, it has some um, uh, instruction associated with it, we do not see it unless it is programmatically connected. So we will talk about that if you, uh, you know, when we offer the workshop and then we will go through all those details in, in four hours, four, four hours. Now, answer to the, this question. <laughs> Can I use a screen reader? I would say that yes, but with the caveat that we have to, there are a lot of conditions to it. It is not designed for accessibility to, to test for accessibility. We, the, uh, the best way to use them is that to verify accessibility issues, not to determine accessibility issues. It is not for keyboard operability because the screen reader, they provide, you know, if, for example, I am never, I have never been good in checking the keyboard operability because it's, I have to use a screen reader user, a screen reader program. My screen reader program, they add some functionality that helps me to get some elements that then, as a non-screen reader user, cannot do it. So uh, he, he's a key, mostly keyboard user. So uh, we, should, we cannot use that for keyboard operability. And then uh, again, you have to be careful to know uh, that uh, that you don't get this false positive result and you have to really know all those limitations. We occasionally hear from people who oh, it is JAWS accessible. We don't have such terminology like this. So forget about it. If somebody says that, so they are not completely in line with accessibility testing. Bottom line, don't use it for testing, but you can use it for to verify the accessibility findings. 
So there are okay. I think this is redundant. We I have discussed about these elements in this slide. I can escape it. And this is a list of the I call the survival command. Um, um, you, some of you probably heard heard that story from me. I had many, at least five colleagues who started for the first time um, Android or a TalkBack or VoiceOver on their iPhone. Uh, and then they didn't know how to turn it off. Because once you were started, the behavior of the uh, device changes. And then you, if you are not familiar, you won't be able to turn off your screen reader. So these are the series of commands. Uh, I, I put that there, I make a comp direct comparison between NVDA and, 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 uh, and JAWS. Uh, that you can uh, see them when you receive the slides. So there are three pages. Now it is we get to the fun part of the application, okay, <laughs> for, for the presentation. I am planning to show you two pages. Let me see what time is it? Three forty-six. Okay. Um, here, uh, a good page. Okay, I think apparently I could lose the other one. But let us go with this one. Um, uh, uh, let me, let me I'm still go back there. Super thing. Okay, it is. It is not working. Let's do that with this page. We don't have very much time either. So as I mentioned, we one of the things that we do when we get to this page. Oh, I need to disconnect it so you can hear that. Uh, let me disconnect my headset. <laughs> Okay, is it loud enough? Visit Seattle, Washington, slower, 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 slower. Visit Seattle, Washington, vertical bar, travel and tourism, vertical bar, visual site. Is it loud enough, hopefully? Yes, yeah, I think so. Good. Okay, that's great. So the first thing that I, I mentioned that earlier after this visual uh, you know, consistency and then functional consistency and keyboard uh, uh, is uh, the, uh, you know, ARIA landmark. Screen Reader, as I mentioned, I have offers a hundred of functions. One of them is to show me the list of the landmark or regions on this page. And I'm going to call that function. Document regions dialog, regions tree view, navigation. One. That is the list of the ARIA regions. For those of you who are familiar, you can laugh. I can, I can, I can hear that. It is navigation, navigation, navigation region, navigation, 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 navigation. <laughs> and so on. So what is the difference between this navigation and other navigation? I mean, or again, that is something that uh, we can laugh about it, but you know, indeed we should cry. <laughs> so um, I, I hope that uh, we can have the chance to meet with them and to talk with them and then show them some of the, uh, the highlights of some of the accessibility issues. Uh, there are, uh, main the main region is missing here. The main region is the area where we put the main content in, uh, the, the real information there. So it is not there. So okay. it is it is pretty useless for me. So okay. escape. My next means to access that to to get information here uh, is check a call for the list of the headings. Heading list dialog. Heading list view. Welcome to Seal colon one. One of thirty five. They start with the heading one. A dynamic urban city surrounded by unmatched natural beauty and fashion. Now it's all open for you to explore. Hold it to two of thirty five. The numbers that you see on the right, it tells me the heading level, and that is a way how I uh, how I can connect these pieces. That, for example, I can say this 
Heading two is a child of heading one. I go plus explore like a local colon two, three of thirty five. I go farther down. Six to do colon two, four of thirty. Watch down, this and see what TV. Seattle good news colon two, travel advisory colon two, seven of thirty five. Plan your trip colon two, eight of thirty five. Food and drink colon four, nine of thirty five. As you see, we don't have any heading three. Three. Now here is where we really get lost here. Did the developer fail to provide a heading three or, or heading four is just a random heading? Uh, then we lose the relationship between this page, be, between the info, the, these pieces of information. So remember, this support is, it's supposed to give us an outline of the uh, content, but let's go further down. Transfer logic, colon four, 11, maps and guides, colon four, arts and culture to experience now, colon three, 30. Then you see that the heading three, so uh, I hope it, it makes it clear how when, when people they use this heading level so randomly, how confusing it can be because we never can conclude the relationship between the information here, uh, the piece of information. Welcome to, back. Safe. Escape. to have another fun is the list of the graphics. Select a graphic dialog. Spot photo call and big alpha. Okay. Here, photo call and big all photography one of three. It is interesting. It doesn't tell me about the content of the graphic. It doesn't anything, but it tells me what company or what person has taken that without any information. Now I am asking myself: Is it really the what is behind it? Is it is it really is it the informational graphics that I should know? Or it is just a piece of you know stylistic uh, information. Sponsor logo. The next one, sp sponsor logo. So how? Why is it important if I do not know who is the sponsor? Then why should I know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing. So it gives you a second. There is a sponsor, but without telling me what the, who the sponsor is. Yeah. And and la the last funny part is this one. So get missing image descriptions, open the context menu, free of free. Okay, so what should I understand of this image? I mean, it is without uh, insulting, it is useless information for a screen reader user. So if we were not in the public meeting, I probably use a different vocabulary. But now let's see that about the form controls. I told you that is a crime, right? That you don't uh, like, see that Select here, the form, these are the dialogue. forms. Play button to progress bar, volume settings but enter full screen image gal image gallery image gallery Im Im image image gallery click to learn more about photo image gallery image, image gallery ga image gallery more more images button twenty two email edit twenty zip edit subscribe button tab twenty six of thirty eight now it said that tab tab twenty seven of thirty eight another tab tab twenty eight of thirty eight another tab tab twenty nine okay. of thirty eight so for those of you who are familiar. I, I, I'm, I'm taking you to that. Okay, button Alt plus O. I'm taking that. Enter. Frame tab selected four or five. Selected four or five. As you probably see that here, there is a, we call the tab panel widget. Selected five or five. I can go left. Selected four or five. Selected three or five. Three or five. Selected two or five. But none of these tabs they have a meaningful name. I checked with my my uh, my colleagues, and they told me these are just icons. So if I am coming to this widget, and I do not know which tab is which, I mean this is, I mean, very dangerous. <laughs> it is useless. This is really useless. I emphasize that it's very useless. Um, and then all these tabs they should have meaningful labels. They can have graphic. But graphic, you know, if you can even be even would use label for that good graphic. But uh, anyway, or they could use graphic behind this uh, in the background, and then have their meaningful label uh, on the foreground. Escape virtual PC. Um, what time is it? Three fifty-four p.m. Three fifty-four. I'm sorry. I stop here. I have a lot of uh, resources uh, that uh, this is part of the information here. Uh, that's part of the. Uh, slides, uh, but uh, I would, uh, would like to respect everybody's time uh, and then open the floor for the questions. We will 
uh, we can stay a little longer for those of you who can make it. But uh, feel free, ask your question. Or Anna Marie, if you have received any questions, we would be glad to discuss it. Uh, we do not have any questions for you at this time. Feel, folks, feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the chat. We'll open your microphone. It's even better. Okay. It's more interactive. And I'm going to put a link in the chat for folks right now. This is a link to our webinars um, archive page. From accessible tech. So from this link, you can access recordings and slide decks from the webinars that we've done this year. And uh, we'll get this one up as soon as we can. It usually takes a week or two because we need to send the video out for captioning. And so we wanna make sure everything's accessible before we put it up there. I have a question. Sure. Hadi, it's Karen. I've been working with you on uh, Docfinity testing. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I am working with another team that is doing some refactoring of existing systems. And I'm wondering what's the best time for developers to be thinking about the hierarchical nature of the of this process that you outlined. I we have had some conversations and our devs have said, oh, we just add the tags at the end, which to me seems like may maybe that could work, but I, I don't know enough about it to know whether it's something that really needs to be considered from the beginning of the process or somewhere, I, I don't know. So that's my question. It is a great question. Thank you for, for asking that question. The best time to act to add this accessibility is when you have the putting on the behind the napkins. <laughs> Believe or not, we have, we get the best result when the the, the this just graphic. I mean, just uh, you know, wireframe and, and some some uh, outline of the application, because mm -hmm. it is not as we had mentioned. It is not just accessibility of the single elements. It is about the. Uh, we have to see that holistically if the application or the task is accessible. I mean, I have seen a lot of developers, they put some elements here, some elements there, and then they said that here, uh, this is how we want. No, it is, it is not, it doesn't work that way. If you put there, there, you put it, and then you have to come, come up with the logic. Sometimes, you know, they put elements that are not related together. Then I ask him, okay, good, you put it there. Now come up with a meaningful label for this group of elements. So it is, again, if you want to think about it later, I'm sorry, it will be a lot of redoing and sometimes changing the code and it will be uh, time consuming and nasty. <laughs> Thank you. I, in, I should clarify that this is a rewrite of an existing system. So they have some constraints. They can't, you know, they can't design it from the, from I understand. the ground. I, so, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Them, but, but again, we can work with their you know, limitations. But that added to it, that way that, you know, we can do that later, later time, I would say that it is significantly more difficult and a lot of redoing stuff because Sometimes it is just you cannot make it accessible if the, the, the way that you have designed is accessible, is inaccessible, I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Question, please. Howdy, this is, um, this is Elliot from the um, UW Libraries. Um, so nice to see you here. Thank you for a great um presentation as always and I, I really really appreciated just your point of like you know for people who are interested like me in testing like to start off with keyboard accessibility really doing like the no mouse challenge stuff and sticking with that and then I've been trying to learn more about NVDA these past months but I, I'm keeping it in my mind to use that not so much as I'm going to use NVDA to find things I'm going to use NVDA more to confirm what I'm finding with keyboard testing now I do I've been trying to like do you have any recommendations for improving my NVDA knowledge? Because I look at YouTube, it's like, I found like some videos, but some seem to be good and some seem to be really not good. Or I'm like slowly learning what H does and K does and 
insert this, insert that. Do you have recommendations for tutorials to like responsibly learn about how to use NVDA? Um, I'm, again, you guys need, if for those of you who want to do that really screen reader testing, you need to change, up, change your concept of seeing. You need to see with your ears. I mean, that is that it is very different when you look at this you know, interface and you see where it is, and then you target another element. But in a real screen reader world, you do not know what is what. Right? And then discovery of what is what, it is the key. And then uh, if somebody asks ask me what is the most uh, you know, the, the difficult problem in, a, in accessibility realm, I would say navigation, navigation, and navigation. I mean, of course, we navigate because we are discovering. Uh, if once you can really close your screen, close, I mean, again, when you see the application, even once, you have some idea about the location of the positions of these functions. Left the but for this real screen with the user, they don't have that Jonathan. point of reference. So it is very difficult for a sighted user to make a good, to become a good screen reader user because they have already some point of reference. But- Hadi, do you mind if I jump in here? Please. Uh, for those I, who I've met, my name is Dan Comden. Uh, I work with Hadi and I've been supporting uh, a, assistive technology users for um, the, the majority of my life. I've uh, been around screen readers for a long time. I am sighted um, and I, I, I still struggle. I think screen readers are a unique application compared to pretty much everything else that you have used, might have used, or have considered using. Um, there are no visual cues or reminders with a screen reader application as to what you can do, what your possibilities are um, for the most part. There are of course some exceptions here, but for, for the most part, you're, what you need to do is memorize uh, keystrokes. And, and uh, like Elliot was just saying, um, you know, just figuring out when to hit H, <laughs> um, which seems like a basic thing, but that's, you know, that's one thing to remember, you know, add that and now add a couple a dozen more just for basic um, usage. And so it's a lot to memorize. It's not the kind of thing you can just pick up um, with, a, with a half an hour of fiddling around. It really is a very different thing. And so that's just one of the reasons why we don't um, encourage folks to jump right into doing screen reader um, uh, as part of their testing, unless, unless they actually use it uh, or rely on it and know how it works already. So I, I won't go into much more detail and I want to steal Hadi's time, but it's, it, it, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's very challenging and it's not like any other software um, that, that you've, see, you've seen or used before. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I know that we passed it 4.03 p.m. 4.03 p.m. But again, we, I will stay until uh, no, to answer everybody's question. But if you need to leave, feel free to do it. Uh, yeah, that uh, uh, I mean, this morning I had a meeting with uh, Mural, M-U-R-A-L. I never learned how to pronounce it properly. For those of you who know this application, it is super complex. And then the company is uh, very much into uh, making the application accessible. And I, we have the pleasure to working with them. And actually, uh, I, I, I cannot make a public comment at this time, but uh, uh, the, uh, it's a really super complex application for me as a, who has not seen that application even once. Even if, when, when I was able to, see, were able to see that interface only once, I, it, I think interaction with, with it would be extremely easier. But at this time, you know, I don't know how many times my student, they told me about it, but I forget about it. I forget, you know, what is what? And then, <laughs> because there are too many things to remember. 
but uh, but if if you see it and then go and do that peripheral accessibility testing, if somebody says tells you go and create a, for example, a sticky note, then you know that where you are going. Does it make sense, Elliot? What I'm trying to say? No, I think that's Anyone? super super helpful. And just you know, thinking back just to my using NVDA just these past months and trying to learn about like. Dan, you're right. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm taking all these notes about like all these, like, just, it seems like alt alone can do a million things in NVDA, but I almost feel like I'm using my eyes more than I've ever had to use my eyes as I'm using NVDA, like trying to figure out where things are, how things work. And so I can, this is a really interesting conversation and your point too, Hadi, just about what applications are like and like how you're feeling like if I could just see it for two seconds, like to me, that is so interesting yeah. that there are such divergent experiences happening with these applications as opposed to there being much more cohesive experiences and, ex you know, with these things. It, it's really a fascinating conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Questions, comment? No? If not, then I would like to thank you for coming to the webinar, and I would like to invite you for uh, uh, you know to join our workshop uh, to be announced uh, for sometime in uh, in January. Uh, the initial plan is that we do one workshop uh, every week, uh, one for JAWS, one for NVDA, and one for VoiceOver on Mac, and then possibly if uh, uh, if if. Uh, from there is demand, you know, we can do that for iOS and then uh, Android. Thanks again. And then uh, the, the recording will be shared with you uh, within a week or so or more. From they, they probably have more problem with my accent. Sorry for the, those caffeinists. <laughs> you have to listen sometime multiple times to find out what I said.